Right. Good to be here. We would like to welcome you tonight. If you're with us first time, I think we've got some folks they said from Florida on the fourth row back. Good to have you. What part of Florida are you all from? Bradenton. Okay. Well, good. Make yourself at home. We're glad to have you with us tonight. All right. Good to have everybody. Every soul that's in this house, I've got good news for every soul of Adam's race. Christ died for you. Amen. 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 That includes the elect, and that includes those who aren't the elect. Right. He died for all of them. <laughs> Amen. All right. Lord willing, meet again Sunday, 10 o'clock for Sunday school, 11 worship service. And uh, just thank the good Lord. The brother is almost right tonight. You hear what he said? He said, the Lord's been better to him than anybody. No, he ain't, son. He's been better to me than anybody. <laughs> All right. Well, good. It's good to have that attitude, don't you think? Amen. Yes, it is. Because I know where he brought me from. And uh, I thank God for it tonight. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Psalm, chapter 51, and verse 14. Psalm 51, verse 14. Scripture says, Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of Thy righteousness. Father, bless Your Word now, in Your holy name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. When I was a child and did something wrong, which I did all the time, my grandfather would say to me, Own up to it own up to it. And he wouldn't let me go until I owned up to it. Instead of blaming, ever, blaming everyone and their brother, uh, I accepted the responsibility for my transgressions. Uh, David is said in the Bible to be a man after God's own heart. And, you know, we compare that uh, with the kind of life he lived and the adultery and then the, uh, the treachery with uh, Uriah the Hittite and murder. And we say to ourselves, now how in the world could uh, a man that's capable of that be after God's own heart? Well, you have to look at some things I think that God wants us to uh, focus on in the life of David. That's very important. Now, folks, you need to be reminded of this. Uh, Israel had a lot of kings. And when David died, his son Solomon uh, became the king by succession. But he didn't hold the kin, he didn't hold the 12 tribes together. And you had a man by the name of Jeroboam in the north who uh, rose up against uh, Solomon because of his counsel and took ten tribes away. So you had a split that took place from that moment on for the rest of the kingdom of Israel and Judah. And so the northern ten tribes were called the tribes of Israel, and their capital was in Samaria. And the southern two tribes were the tribes of Judah. Their capital was in uh, Jerusalem. And from that moment on, there was friction between the northern tribes and the southern tribes. And it did lead at times to civil war, which is a horrible thing because it was brother against brother. And so therefore, the only man that was able to pull Israel together, and he reigned for 40 years, was David. And David's a type of Christ in many, many, many ways. And uh, in my book, uh, I accept David as a hero in the Bible. Uh, even in the fact that he had a lot of problems, no question about that. He had fleshly sins that he committed. Yes, he did. And I'll make no excuses or any condoning of anything that he did in that nature. Fact is, I'm going to try to use some of that tonight to instruct. But David had courage. He was a man of war. He was a warrior. He would not uh, send his men to the field to battle. He'd lead them in the field to battle. Of course, you know the story of Uriah. He hadn't gone out that time. Uh, he stayed in Jerusalem and didn't lead his men to battle. And that's what got him in trouble. But in any event, uh, he was, he was, he, uh, David was a man of courage, but he was also a singer. He, was, he worshiped God. Many of the Psalms, are, you can call them songs, that were written by David to worship the Lord. And they, they're, quite, uh, they're quite involved when you begin to study uh, what all he said. David understood who God was. He, there was no doubt in his mind. He was never an idolater. He knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knew him. He knew him personally. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you look at the faith of David, the Old Testament saint, you'll find about as pure a form of it as you'll find anywhere. Uh, the Old Testament, folks, is uh, unlike the New Testament where it says in Romans chapter number 10, verse number 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's clear. Uh, but the truth is, I don't believe in formulas, neither Old Testament nor New Testament. 
Formulas don't get you saved, folks. Christ, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. What gets a man saved is real contrition in his heart, a willingness to turn to God and have faith in him, trust him. And the Old Testament saint was saved the same way. He was saved the same way by turning to the Lord in faith and trusting God and seeking forgiveness for his sins, and God forgave him. The New Testament's the same, but of course in the New Testament, they knew far more than they did in the Old Testament, no question. And as I've said to you before, the Old Testament saint could be forgiven for his sins, but they were not taken away. Because they were not taken away, there was a certain amount of guilt that remained, and the Scripture teaches that. And with that burden, and with that sorrow, and with that a number of things that are associated with guilt. And it remained. It couldn't be taken away until Christ came. And then once the Lord Jesus did establish the New Testament in His blood, then the guilt can be taken away, and there's perfect peace and forgiveness and cleansing through the blood of Christ. And that's one of the major differences between the Old Testament saint and the New. But the Old Testament saint was saved just like we are by putting his faith in God and his trust in, 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 in the Lord and the light that he had and following that. And when they sinned in the Old Testament, you can use David probably as one of the greatest illustrations in the Bible of how a man feels and what he goes through once he has sinned and how he got right with God. And that's a great object lesson to teach people how to get right with God. Because to this very day, there's an awful lot of misconception and misunderstanding and confusion in the issue of getting right with God. And after all, don't you think that's the most important thing? You remember we've talked from 1 John at length about how that chapter number one deals with sin on a high level, a spiritual level, before it is ever manifested in the deed. This is what's important. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to cleanse us, forgive us all unrighteousness. The confession of sin is the confession of what the Holy Spirit points out in your soul before you ever do it. And once, you, once you've done that, then you're walking in fellowship with the Lord. And if you allow it to uh, manifest itself, then you're going to get in trouble. And then He goes on for the second stage and says, if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. So it enters into a legal situation standing before God. You don't have that in the Old Testament. You don't have that depth of understanding and meaning when it comes to it. You simply have the way they felt, and this is what David gets into. He talks about in chapter number 51 of Psalm and verse 14, this is conviction. Conviction is important, folks. Conviction is very important. I just want to give you a word to take home and think about. You don't have to, you don't, I'm not going to deal with uh, with it tonight. But I want you to think about what I'm going to say. Now think about this. Sinners condemning sinners. Think about that. Just take that home and meditate on I've got an awful lot of faces looking at me tonight. I say, what do you mean by that? Think about where your condemnation should come from. And let's not say condemnation, but your conviction. Where does it come from? Where does real conviction come from? Does it come from brow beating from a human being, from a sinner just like you? The truth of the matter is that offends most people. This is where you get the term, judge not that you be not judged, right? They'll throw that right back in your face. You pinpoint something in their life. Uh, you approach them or you, you come face to face with them over something they've done. It's not that they haven't done it. Surely they've done it. But do you want a sinner telling you that you've done it? In other words, someone who is in the same boat you're in. You understand what I'm trying to say here tonight? I'm trying to raise us up tonight to a little higher level to begin to understand the issue with God. Conviction comes from Scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. In the Old Testament, the conviction came sometimes by the prophet. If you remember, Nathan was a prophet. And Nathan's the one who confronted David over his sin with Bathsheba. But it doesn't mean that David hadn't already had some problems with what he'd done. That's what's important. You need to understand that. You see, Nathan, a prophet, and the prophet was uh, the prophet. Uh, he was a unique individual. Uh, he spoke for God. Thus saith the Lord. Uh, the, and God used Nathan to speak to David, but God didn't have to have Nathan to speak to David. The reason for Nathan speaking to David was to become official. Was to bring it out into the open, where he could no longer hide what was going on inside his soul. David had a soul just like the rest of us, and he could be convicted. And then he said in Psalm 51 when he prayed, 
Lord, deliver me from blood guiltness. That's as plain as it can be. You don't need any, uh, you don't need any definition. I'm guilty of blood. You remember what God said to Cain? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth to me from the ground. Yes, he was guilty of innocent blood. So what did it produce? Well, in Psalm 38, verse number 1, here's what David said. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. This is sorrow. 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 If you want to live a joyful life, you leave sin alone as much as you can. I mean, just as plain as I know how to put it. Uh, sin is a deadly thing. Yes, it is, in more ways than one. So it brought sorrow. Now, David said, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, and neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. In other words, show graciousness and mercy to me and long suffering if you have to deal with me over this issue with Bathsheba. In Psalm 38 and verse number 3, Conviction of sin brings pain. Notice what it says, 38 verse 3, Psalm. There's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I'm troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Man. Here's a man that was in misery. No question. No question. He was in misery. But that's a good thing because it shows he has a conscience. Do you remember what Cain said to God when, uh, when the Lord uh, put that mark upon him and cast him forth? He said, my, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Remember that? The only thing Cain concerned himself over was how he felt and the consequences of what he'd done. Not the victim. Not the one he'd murdered. That was never an issue with him. It was still all about Cain. Remember? My punishment is greater than I can bear. But not with David. David said, there's no soundness. Deliver me from blood guiltness. I've done it. I'm not blaming anyone else. Nowhere does he ever blame anyone else but himself. He accepts full responsibility for his sin. Now, when a man or a woman does that, then you can start dealing with them. When you get away, if you ever get past the blame game and trying to hide behind other people. Now, folks, it's not hard to hide behind people. We got a house full of sinners tonight. Did that make you mad? Or are you willing to face the truth? There's none righteous. No, not one. The only righteousness that matters is the righteousness of the righteous one. And there's only one righteous one. That's the God man who lived a sinless, perfect life. So sure, it's pain. It's pain. Folks, do you realize how many people tonight are sitting at the bar trying to drink away their sorrow and their pain? shot themselves up with dope to go off into an altered state of consciousness, whatever, whatever route they take, just to get away from this pain. In Psalm chapter number 31 and verse number 10, he said, My life is spent with grief, my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity. See this? Mine iniquity. And my bones are consumed. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity and my bones are consumed. How many's ever heard of the National Cancer Institute? This is not a hay boy corner. This is the National Cancer Institute. You realize that unconfessed sin can affect you physically? Did you realize it could affect your health? Here's what they say. It said, although chronic stress, which can be, stress can, of course, be brought on by unconfessed sin, unforgiven sin. Uh, although chronic stress can lead to many health problems, whether it is linked to cancer is not clear. Studies conducted to date have varied, had varying results. For example, one case control study among Canadian men found an association between workplace stress and the risk of prostate cancer. Now, that's something to think about, especially when you're 77 years old. And I go to the urologist every year. And I just had a series of, of tests done. And thanks be unto God, they did a 12 segments on my prostate. And it was all benign. Hallelujah. But it could have been cancerous. I didn't know what it was. See? And so, uh, but in any event, uh, prostate, uh, prostate's a big issue. It's like breast cancer for women. A prostate issue with men. You know, it's, it's just an issue there. And says that uh, association between workplace stress 
and prostate cancer. So you suppose that could be carried over to women? Workplace stress? And uh, women don't have prostate, but they can have breast cancer. Of course. A, pro a prospective study among more than 100,000 UK women reported no association between the risk of breast cancer and perceived stress levels or adverse life effects, events, adverse life events in the preceding five years. Another study, a 15-year prospective study of Australian women at increased risk of familiar breast cancer, cancer found no association between acute and chronic stressors, social support, optimism, or other emotional characteristics and the risks of breast cancer. In a 2008 meta-analysis of 142 prospective studies among people in Asia, Australia, Europe, and America, stress was associated with a higher incidence of lung cancer. A 2019 meta-analysis of nine observational studies in Europe and North America also found an association between work stress and risk of lung, colorectal, and esophageal cancers. A meta-analysis of 12 cohort studies in Europe found no link between work stress and the risk of lung, colorectal, breast, or prostate cancer. So there's mixed results, mixed results. But there's enough of it in there to make you wonder. Mixed results. A lot of it too, no doubt, has to do with the way, the manner in which they do the test, who's doing the test, and so forth. Uh, but they have done enough to understand that there may be a connection between stress and cancer. I am not offering medical advice. So please understand that tonight. <laughs> but what I am telling you is that stress is a killer because it can raise your blood pressure. I read this a little while ago and raise your sugar level. Headaches, all kinds of problems that can come from stress. So what do you do? You deal with the issue of stress. Where does it come from? I just read a few minutes ago earlier today where this young, young woman, mother, young mother, she's got an 18-year-old son, drove off into the, some park up in North Carolina, and she's a pastor's wife, and she put a gun to her head and blew her brains out. I felt so sad for that, so sorry, so sad, because I know what pastors and pastor's wives go through. I understand. I read some of the comments, and uh, beneath, uh, they always comment. And some of the comments said, so sad, wish we'd, you know, we could pray or somehow or another help this dear soul before she did something like that. They said she had mental problems. Well, mental problems can be brought on by stress. One wrote in and says, uh, what kind of stress does a pastor or a pastor's wife have? <laughs> I thought to myself, try it, son. And you'll understand what's going on. But I felt so bad for her. Young woman, young woman, young woman. And she just simply, for some reason, I don't know what it was, I have no idea. And uh, I pray for the family. It's sad, so sad, you know, so sad. Uh, if, if you find yourself in a stressful situation and the situation is not going to change, then you need to change your location. Right. If it's workplace, horrible, terrible workplace, you know, dog fight, black guarding, cursing, everything, drunken, all this and that going on all the time, get out of there. Go find you somewhere else. <laughs> I remember when I was a professional mechanic, I used to roll my toolbox. <laughs> So what that mean? I left that shop and went to another shop. Never had, didn't it take five minutes to get another job. They were always in demand. And uh, mechanics, I'm sure to this day, are still in demand. Say, so how do you know? All these broke down cars out here, somebody's got to fix them. Amen. So David said he's in pain. He's in pain. Psalm 32, verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. I don't think for one minute that David thought that all of this was going to come upon him when he yielded that night to the lust of, that night to the lust of the flesh. I don't believe for a minute. And you notice how that once he had yielded to the lust of the flesh, that was just the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> that was just the beginning. It wasn't the end of anything. It was the beginning, and uh, it cost a man his life. Well, you have conviction, sorrow, pain, then humility, and humility is a good thing, folks. 
Humility is one of the best things that you'll find in any person. Psalm 38, verse 9, Lord, all my desires before thee, my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth. My strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. In plain words, he, he responded the way that you ought to. When it all began to fall apart, he reached up to the one who changes not. Amen. I look to the rock that is higher than I. Now, let me tell you something. I learned from personal experience. And this will help you, should help anyone. You cannot change circumstances sometimes. You can't change them. But you can focus your mind on the one who is able to bring you through whatever circumstance you're in. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You focus on him. Keep your mind focused on the Son of God. And that has done wonders for me. Then it brings you to repentance. Psalm 38, 18, For I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. We don't hear much repentance preached today, do we? No. Repentance is a good thing, folks. You're not saved because you repent. You repent because you are saved. If you have saving faith that builds up in your soul, you are going to repent. Believe me. The Holy Spirit will work that work of grace in your heart. You understand that repentance is grace. It's a work of grace. And that work of grace will take hold in your heart. And you will repent. And you'll repent. And then you'll start repenting of stuff that you didn't even think about. And the more you repent, the more you're going to want to repent. And then you're going to repent. And then you're going to repent. And think, once you've figured and think you've repented all you're going to repent, then you're going to repent some more. Because the Holy Ghost is working on you. Amen. I remember when I first went back to the shop when I got saved. Man alive. I was on that line working on cars, come in, fix one, pull it out, get another one, raise it up, start working on it. And I was back there preaching to myself and repenting and crying and carrying on like you wouldn't believe. Those other mechanics probably thought I was crazy. Amen. But I was happy. <laughs> My sins were gone. Hallelujah. Repentance. Now, here's what he said in Psalm 51, verse 3. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. See that? He said, it's my sin. You know, see, he said, mine iniquity. I can't emphasize that enough tonight. You say, well, preacher, you know, I wouldn't have done this or that if, if I hadn't been with this or that. Yeah, but you chose to be with this or that. You made choices. And when you go back and look at the choices you make, they get you in trouble. They get you in trouble. I'm sure that you, a lot of people lend to your fall. Uh -huh. There's a lot of people out there, folks, who live for nothing else than to watch you hit, watch you fall. They want to watch you go down. That's what they live for. And the person that does that is the most unstable person on this earth. Amen. Because if you think by pulling yourself up by watching some soul go down, you're in bad shape. But that's what's out there. But then I like this part in Psalm 51, verse 10. David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See this? He, he, this is theology, folks. This is not homespun doctrine. Lord, clean my heart up and renew a right spirit in me. Restore me. He said, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You don't have to pray that prayer in the New Testament. The Old Testament saint was not born again. He wasn't sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are. We are. He'll never leave you. But he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. This is restoration. Don't you, wouldn't you rather see your brothers and your sisters? Well, when you, sometimes you'll see them, you know, they're, they're just not standing like they should stand. They, they become weak. And you see them giving into things that just a few years ago they had strong convictions against. And now they're beginning to vacillate and they're beginning to move this way. Pray for them. And pray for the restoration. Remember that. That's what's important. Because a sledgehammer tears a house down, but it takes a, it takes a skilled craftsman to build one. That's exactly right. Yes, it does. A skilled craftsman. In the Old Testament, there was a king by the name of Manasseh. We read about him in 2 Chronicles 33, verse 11. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh 
among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. Did you see that? When he was in affliction. The Bible says, he that hath suffered hath ceased from sin. You know that? It says that. I don't have the reference right here, but all you got to do is get a concordance. He that hath suffered hath ceased from sin. And so the Bible says, they bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And folks, Manasseh was one of the most wicked kings they had. He brought every form of idolatry into Israel, everything you can imagine. He defiled the temple of God. They had an abominable thing there. And he was, he was in all of it. And yet the Bible says he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him and was entreated of him and heard his, her supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that Jehovah was God. The Lord was God. Amen. Then he knew he was God. And from all indications, he stuck with it till he died. When he got right, he got right. So David's repentance as recorded in the scripture is one of the best records of a soul getting right with God. It really is. His record of repentance and getting right with the Lord is one of the best in all the Bible. And somebody said, well, what do you think then is the thing about uh, David after God's own heart? Well, you know, a lot of, you could say a lot of different things, but I'll tell you one thing that speaks well of him. He knew how to get right with God. And there's no question with anybody that David got right with God. And he suffered through his sin. And it ate him alive what he had done. And that's a good message. That's a good lesson for people today. You don't just sin and get away with it. It doesn't, you know. You, sin is a deadly thing. And it'll eat you up. Now here's what it says in the book of Proverbs chapter 15 verse 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. See that? You know why you don't sing in the choir? You know why you don't shout? You know why you don't rejoice? Now, I'm not telling you have to shout and run around in here and, and uh, that you, you be you. But, uh, you know, there's no joy in your soul. There's nothing in there. Why? I'll tell you why. There's something between you and God. You know, one of the greatest things there is about a Christian is that there's a joy that you can't explain. He said, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You can't explain it, but it's real, folks. There's a reality to it. It's a joy. There's something about that. Proverbs 17, verse 22 says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. In plain words, the end, it implies that if you get right with God, and the joy of the Lord's rising up in your soul. You get rid of your stress and you'll be healthier. <coughs> That's the indication from Scripture. That it'll make you healthier. I wonder, I wonder if they did let me get on TV and advertise this. They're on there selling their pills and their drugs. I wonder if, like, if they let me get on there and say, if you get right with God, it'll cure an awful lot of this stuff, these pills they're trying to sell you. <laughs> Amen. So what do you want for it? Nothing. Freely you have received, freely give. Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's why the song service is so important. Have you noticed how well the song service goes? I'm telling you. You ought to sit up here where I am and hear that coming out right behind you. The power, I can feel power up here sometimes. It'll blow your mind. Yes, sir. And have you noticed how a lot of times when the service starts, the first word that comes out of the choir, there's power in it. He's there already. He shows up. And I praise God for that. And uh, <laughs> a merry heart, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, that's the songs. You know, I, how many, good night, man, we've got, I don't know how many songs are in these books, and this is nothing. This little, little handful of songs we have here, nothing compared to the vast amount of material 
that's been written, glorifying songs written to glorify God, poems, psalms, and all of that. And they're still writing them. It's all out there because they love the Lord. They're praising His holy, righteous name. But now here's what it says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Yeah. That word hard is the Greek, is the Hebrew. We're in Hebrew now, Old Testament. Etan. Etan. You know what that word means? Ever flowing, permanent, enduring. That's quite a thing. The way of the transgressors hard, ever flowing, permanent, enduring. What do you mean by that? It's ever constantly giving out bitterness, death, sorrow. It's feeding, 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 eating, eating, eating. And there's no peace in it. Here's what he says in Isaiah chapter number 57, verse 20. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Amen. None. No peace. You ever notice why they want to party all the time? Why, well, sure they want to party. They can't take life. They can't handle it. They want to party. They want to keep a racket going. They want to be running with somebody. They want to be doing something. They won't sit still. They won't sit down and meditate. They won't think. I mean, that's, to me, I like, I like I, as the older I get, the more I appreciate quiet. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Whew. Some of these guys get these cars and they... they Four-cylinder engine with this great big pipe on it. <laughs> I don't want to make any of you mad tonight, but <laughs> there ain't nothing sounds like a V8. Amen. That V8's got a rumble in it, buddy. I don't care. I don't care how big your pipe is on that four-cylinder. <laughs> sounds like a mad bumblebee. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and you ride around that thing all day long. I can't believe it. <laughs> oh Lord my wife's brother had a 1966 Chevelle 396 360 horsepower you remember that one don't you four on the floor I drove that thing one time, I, a time and I saw some GTOs out there and some this and that out there you want some of this <laughs> I wasn't going to tear his car up but I had some power underneath that hood buddy Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like that sound. How do we get off on cars? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yes, sir. There's nothing. Uh... <laughs> How many of you knew Jim Brown? Jim Brown. Carl, I think his name was Carl. Carl Brown. Carl's a good buddy, good friend. Came here for 30-something years. And he went on to be with the Lord a few years ago. He liked to drag race. Out there on, uh, uh, what's that called? The Manorville Pike. Out there on the left, there's a drag, drag strip out there. And, uh, oh, he loved to drag race. He's a mechanic. And so he could build his, own, build his own machine. And, oh, he loved a drag race. They said when he was sick and, and uh, he was in bed that his feet were going like this. That's what they do when they sit at the line watching the lights until it finally hits. I never did do that, but he was ready when he was in, when he was in, when he was in bed. He loved a drag race. He never outgrew it. And there's power there. there. There's power. There's power in those big engines. Yes, sir. Well, I thank the good Lord tonight that I don't go home and pine away and cry and weep and crawl up in a hole, depressed to death and ready to die. No, I get mad and get through my stuff, but I've got a place of joy, too. Yes, I do. I rejoice. Amen. I, yes, I do. Talk to the Lord. Sometimes I'll start talking to God, and I'll feel joy come down in my soul because I know we're connected and we're communicating. And I thank the good Lord for that. If you're not doing it, come back. I encourage you tonight. Come back. Start talking to God. He wants to talk to you. Start talking to Him. If you're born again, you have a direct access to the Father. There's no one between you and God but the Son. The Son takes you to the Father. That's it. There's no human being between you and the Lord. If you're a born-again believer, there is one God and one mediator. 
between God and men, the man, the God man, the one who is incarnate, the God man, God and Christ. Father, thank you tonight for the little time we had together in your word. I pray that I've tried to say something tonight, try to help somebody, encourage them. Lord, if they're, if they're miserable tonight, oh God, I don't know of a worse misery in this world than for a Christian to have unconfessed sin and be miserable and they know what the good is and they know what joy is and they haven't had it in a long time. Oh, I pray that they'd want it back. I pray they would. I pray they'd want it back. I pray they'd turn from whatever they're in and take hold of Christ again. Cry out to him. And the same one that saved them will restore them. And he'll put them back where they can sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And they can sing and make melody in their heart unto the Lord. They can do that once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Brother Michael Melanick's going to sing for us tonight. We'd like to invite him up. <clears throat> oh, I ask the Lord to comfort me when things weren't going my way. He said to me, I will comfort you and lift all your cares away. I ask the Lord to endure. Oh, excuse me. I ask the Lord to walk with me when darkness was all that I knew. He said to me, Never be afraid. For I will see you through. And I didn't ask for riches. He gave me wealth untold. The moon, the stars, the sun, the sky. He gave me eyes to behold. I thank the Lord for everything. I, I count my blessings each day. He came to me when I needed him. I only had to pray. I didn't ask for riches. He gave me wealth untold. The moon, the stars, the sun, the skies. He gave me eyes to behold. I thank the Lord for everything. And I count my blessings each day. He came to me when I needed him. I only had to pray and he'll come to you if you ask him to. For he's only a prayer away. Amen. All right, we have your prayer request tonight. Back here in the back, Lucas. I'd just like to say thank you for all of you who prayed for Addie. Uh, she's doing much better. She got to come good. home from the hospital yesterday. Yeah, good. And um, she was a very sick little girl last Wednesday. And <clears throat> I'm sure it's because of the prayers that went up for her. But Thursday, she just kind of did a turnaround. 
and began to get better. Good. So thank you so much. Good. Amen. Anybody else? I just want to thank the church for praying for Phil's brother, Roy. He got three weeks now. He's not had to get any blood. He's been having tr blood transfusions. He's got some kind of blood cancer. And three weeks now, he's been good. And we just praise the Lord for Amen. that. Thank the church for praying. Amen. All right. Benny is going to get his original stint taken out tomorrow, finally. And uh, just pray that all that goes well for him. Yes. Amen. All right. Okay. Sorry. I'm continuing to pray for my family in the drug situation. And then... Pray for all motorcyclists on the road. There was a bad accident in Gatlinburg two nights ago where a young man died, and just pray for that family. All right, amen. What else? I just would like to say uh, we have a lot of people watching us right now in the United Kingdom and Ireland in a lot of different states and I'm talking to them live and uh, I'd just like for everybody to realize how powerful this is, this online and to keep us in prayer and uh, Pastor Charles also Ministries is our channel on YouTube. Amen. Thank you. All right. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Well, you have an unspoken request tonight. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Tony Hopkins, will you lead us, please? Thank you, brother. Well, folks, I guess I'm done. We'll have uh, you all stand up, and we'll have prayer with you, and we'll let you go. All right. Brother Andy Walden, dismiss us, please.